Good morning. Let's get ready to get into the word of God. We're so blessed uh, that they led us in that time of worship, but I'm excited to continue in this short series with you, series of messages uh, entitled Surviving the Wilderness. Whether you know it or not, we are all in the midst of a wilderness season right now, and they can be tough to navigate. And so we are dealing with how do you get through seasons of scarcity? How do you survive seasons of hardship uh, when it seems like all is lost or all is against you or seasons that are tough? And so we've been dealing with that. And we started last week looking at Moses and the children of Israel. We want to go throughout scripture and lift up uh, historical narratives that deal with individuals and nations who spent time or prolonged periods in the wilderness. And the wilderness does not necessarily always mean the desert uh, when we see it in the Bible, uh, but we are lifting up those who are in the midst of desert experiences in scripture. And so last week we dealt with Moses and the children of Israel and how they uh, went through the wilderness for 40 years and how a generation could not pass the test of the wilderness. They could not make it through this season or this period of hardship. Uh, they complained, they grumbled, they, they grumbled, they murmured, they talked against their leader. They didn't trust God and his provision where God would have to prove himself over and over again. And so they died in the wilderness. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle Paul when speaking to the Corinthian church says, let's use them as an example. And so he says the same way they did all of these things bad and, and, and all of these negative things, he says, I don't want you, church, to be like these people. Likewise, I'm speaking to you today, the body of Christ, in the 21st century. God's word is still relevant to say as we traverse through this wilderness time period that our nation is in, that you are in, that the nations of the earth are in. We don't want to be like the children of Israel and fall in the wilderness. So last week, we looked at a passage of scripture uh, that dealt with the failures uh, of a nation. And so this week, I want to look at the triumph of an individual, one who found victory in the wilderness. We can learn from people's failures, but this week, we want to learn from someone's success. And so last week, we dealt with Moses and the children of Israel. This week, I want to deal with Jesus Yes, God incarnate, God himself, as he spent time in the wilderness. So let's go to Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 1, and then we'll conclude our reading at verse number 11. As you're turning there, Jesus, I thank you that your word is life. It brings life. It gives life. It speaks life. And Father, you have come to speak to us that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So I thank you for spending these moments with us. Father, they hear uh, my voice talking, but I pray today that they would ultimately hear and see you and that this word would fall in good ground, in the good soil of their hearts and produce uh, fruit at the proper time. Hide this word in their heart now. Remove any distractions, anything that would try to steal their mind, steal their gaze. We've come to gaze upon you and your word. Speak to us, Lord, and we will never be the same in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse number 1. And again, we'll conclude our reading at verse number 11. I'm reading from the New International Version of Scripture. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, 
and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. I'm going to be discussing all 11 or 12 of these verses uh, today. I'll hit at them. We read Matthew 4 verses 1 through 11, but this passage of scripture is also recorded in Luke's gospel and Mark uh, hits at this experience in about a verse or two in Mark chapter 1. And so I'm going to mention those, but we've read from Mark verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And so I'll hit at Luke 4. I may mention Mark 1 and that one verse a time or two, but this will be our primary reading for today. So I want to focus our attention on all of these verses, but I want to key in the title of my message comes from verse number one because it can baffle you if you look at it. If you look at all of scripture, it can kind of confuse you. It could lead to more questions. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Last I heard, ministers or preachers told me God does not tempt us. If I flip over a few scriptures or so, I could draw that conclusion that God does not tempt us. But then I see in this verse, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What's happening here? What in the world is going on? Surviving the wilderness too. But as a subtopic, I want to talk about tempted in the test tempted in the test. To do me a favor and type that in the comments right now. Tempted in the test. Testify about it to your digital neighbor. Maybe you're at home watching with the family, a few people in the neighborhood for a watch party. So happy that you're here. Lean over to them in the couch, the recliner, the love seat, and tell them tempted in the test. I'm in love with all of scripture. There's not a book, not a passage of scripture that I cannot glean and learn and grow from. But each book in the Bible has a different purpose. It accomplishes something different. Now, ultimately, the Bible is written to reveal one person to us, and that is Jesus Christ. But the way each Bible writer or, or, or each author of, 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 of an, each book goes about it is a little different. For example, John reveals Jesus in his deity, and then Luke reveals Jesus in his humanity. They both point to Jesus, but each of them do it and, and point to a different area. Mark reveals Jesus as the servant who does, and so he doesn't waste a lot of time on Jesus' origin story and how he came to earth through Mary and Joseph and how they had to escape down to Egypt. Mark just goes right into Jesus' doing. He is the suffering servant who does. So he goes right into the works. Jesus does this. He's healing this, raising this person from the dead, casting out demons over here. That's what he does. But I love Matthew because Matthew 
points to Jesus as the Messiah. He connects and builds the bridge to bring us Jesus from the Old Testament and connect him to this Jesus in the New. He points to a number of uh, older passages. He points to scriptures in the Old Testament and brings us into connection and says he's the one. When we see Jesus riding a donkey, he brings us into connection and says he is the fulfillment of those passages of scripture in Zechariah. He points to Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 and says he is the fulfillment of the one that Isaiah talks about. And so Matthew's purpose, Matthew or Levi, the businessman, the tax collector, his purpose is to reveal Jesus as Messiah. And what I love is he reveals Jesus' lineage. He points us to his right to be the Messiah. And so he starts with Judah. And he starts with the tribe of Judah. And how David is the king in Judah. The king from the line of Judah. And he goes from David to Solomon to on down to all 42 generations. And he reveals that Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. Pray with me for a moment. I'm going somewhere. And he says, Jesus, you are the rightful heir. You deserve to be on the throne because after all, you are in the lineage of King David. And although we were exiled to Babylon, you still have not lost your lineage. Although we were exiled then to Persia, You still have not lost your lineage. You still are the rightful heir. And although the Greeks took over the world at one time period, you still are the rightful heir to the throne. And although now, as we pick up in the New Testament, the Romans are the dominant power, you are still the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And so... We see Jesus coming on the scene in Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. We see that Jesus is already under attack. And his life and the lives of his loved ones, his mother and his father, are being threatened. And the Bible says that they have to escape and go to Egypt. We're just a few weeks away from Christmas, so you don't mind if I just begin to start turning the page. I'm not going to go there today, but you don't mind if I just start walking into it. We're getting ready to celebrate the coming king in just a few weeks. But, but we see that Jesus and his mother and his father, they have to escape to Egypt because they are getting ready to be killed, because they are seen as a threat. and They don't even know why. Someone watching We're already getting ready to get into my first point. You're trying to figure out why the enemy is attacking you because you are a threat and you don't even know it. There's someone who's viewing me at home, maybe listening to me in the car, maybe jogging somewhere as they're listening to this message later in the week. And I'm here to announce to you whether you know it or not, you are a spiritual threat. Don't you dare get free. Don't you dare even think about serving God in the days of your youth because you are a threat. Maybe you're not in the days of your youth. I'm someone's watching who's an elder whose hair is white and gray and it's your crown, it's your splendor. So, so boast about it, shout about it, don't hide it, don't, don't put it under a cap, don't, don't spray it away with some hair color. Show your gray, show your white. And maybe you're a little older and you're watching, and I'm here to tell you, even in your elder and your senior years, don't you dare decide to serve God in your elder and in your senior years because you are a threat. And whether you know it or not, the enemy sees you as a threat. This is why he wants to stop the church from praying. This is why he wants to stop the church from singing. This is why he wants to stop the church from gathering together because he knows the body of Christ united He is a threat. And so Jesus and his mother and his father, they are a threat. And they don't even realize it. They don't even know it. They're just under attack. And they are trying to figure out why. It is because the kingdom of darkness heard something proclaimed over their lives. And he was concerned, could this be the one coming to crush my head. Let us not forget, 
This is not the first time that Satan has heard a word of prophecy spoken over his life. When God speaks to him in Genesis, after he tempted Adam and Eve, there was a promise given to him. Yes, the body of Christ is not the only one who have been given promises. There was a promise given to Satan, and he says, there is a seed coming who will crush your head. Glory to God. And he heard something proclaimed over this baby. He heard angels singing over this baby. He, he heard shepherds, or he saw shepherds leaving their flocks at night, coming to worship this baby. He heard and he saw magi coming from the east, traversing through desert regions, putting their lives on the line to be willing to give gifts to this baby. So he recognizes that there is something in this Jesus. And I don't know who this is for. Maybe the reason the enemy is trying to threaten your life or he sees you as a threat is he understands there was a word proclaimed over your life. You may not even know about it. It was given to grandmother, grandfather, your ancestors. Maybe it was prophesied to your pastor about you and you were just a baby. Or maybe your pastor or a prophetic person spoke it over your life at your baby blessing. And you weren't there. You can remember it. You couldn't hear it. But there was something spoken over your life. And there was a word over your life. And that could be the very reason that you are under attack. So Jesus, chased by kings, worshipped by shepherds and wise men, the triune nature of God is revealed when Jesus steps on the scene. We're in chapter 4 for our reading today, but you don't mind if I just walk you to it. We talked about chapter 1, chapter 2, now let's get to chapter 3. Chapter 3, Jesus steps on the scene and he sees his cousin John the Baptist. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And the Bible says in chapter 3, at that moment, the triune nature of God is revealed. We see God the Son, Jesus Christ, standing there in the water. The Bible says, and the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. And we hear a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So God the Son, standing in the water, God Holy Spirit coming down like a dove, and God the Father speaking from heaven. The triune nature of God is being revealed in chapter 3. So chapter 1 of Matthew, we have Jesus recognized as the messianic king, the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. Chapter 2, we see Jesus on the run being threatened uh, by kings and being worshipped by shepherds and wise men. Chapter 3, the triune nature of God is being revealed. The reason I want to give all of that to you is because all of these great things happen in the life of Jesus. But none of these things, as great as they are, exempt him from the wilderness. Glory to God. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but this is a word for somebody. Don't you click away. Don't, don't, don't you allow your short attention span to rob you of this moment. There's a word for you if you sit here and receive it. All of these great things, Jesus, the rightful heir to the throne of Israel, the 42nd in the line of King David, the man after God's own heart, but it does not exempt him. From the wilderness, Jesus, chased and threatened by kings, worshipped by wise men, given gifts by wise men, worshipped by shepherds, but it does not exempt him from the wilderness. The triune nature of God being revealed, God the Father speaking from the sky, God Holy Spirit coming down on him like a dove, but it does not exempt him from the wilderness. God the Father himself speaking that he is well pleased with Jesus, but it does not exempt him from the wilderness. This gives us a hint, a clue, that just because we are in the wilderness does not mean that God is angry with us. Our wilderness experiences does not mean that we have sinned. Our wilderness experiences does not mean because, because we have been disobedient to God. I don't get in the wilderness just because I didn't tithe. I don't get in the wilderness just because, glory to God, I miss church on Sunday. 
This wilderness does not mean that I have committed adultery. I'm speaking to somebody. This wilderness experience does not mean that I don't have a prayer life. This wilderness experience does not mean that I have not given God what is due him and kept him first in my life. This is for those outside critics who like to look at your life and my life and they like to judge the trouble we are going through and, we like to say, and they like to say because we are experiencing that trouble, it means we didn't worship and serve God. Just because we are in the wilderness does not mean we don't serve God. The voice of God the Father himself spoke, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And in the next chapter, just a few verses later, in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1, it says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Thank you, Jesus. The same spirit that descended on him like a dove and anointed him. That same spirit. That same spirit that filled him up. I told you we didn't read it, but I told you I was, I was going to mention it. Look at Luke's four, Luke 4. In Luke's account, he says, Then Jesus, full of the spirit, enters into the wilderness. Then Jesus, full of the spirit, is led into a Judean desert. I'm here to let you know that the same spirit that fills us, the same spirit that can occupy every area of our life, the same spirit that can anoint us and come down on us in bodily form as a dove can be the same spirit that can lead us into the wilderness. And the Bible says that Jesus, full of the spirit, was led into the wilderness. Glory to God, full of the Spirit, but in the wilderness. Let's take it a little further. Speaking in tongues, but in the wilderness. Prophesying, but in the wilderness. Tithing, but in the wilderness. Seeking God in prayer three times a day like Daniel did, but in the wilderness. Giver, but in the wilderness. Faithful in your marriage, but it's in the wilderness. Faithful to your job, there on time every day, but furloughed and in the economic wilderness. Woke up every morning and went to the gym, but in a health wilderness. Woke up every day, did your sit-ups, ate right, had a plant-based diet, but received a terminal diagnosis, and now, health-wise, you are in the wilderness. This can perplex us. This can disturb us at first glance. Because last I heard, when I read Scripture, God does not tempt us, but he leads Jesus, the Bible says, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. James 1, verse 13 says that God cannot tempt us. There's no evil in God. God cannot tempt us to do evil. So how can I reconcile James 1, 13 and Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1? I wish I had all day, but I'll just try to give it to you in a few moments and get out of your way. But let me give it to you like this. I remember I was in school once. And I had to take a test, and it was a very important test. And if I passed this test, I had uh, not done too well in the course. But if I passed the test, I would have passed the class. So everything hung on this test. If I failed the test, I would have failed the class. So it was all on the line. I played around all quarter or all semester long, and now it had all caught up to me. But if I pass this test, all of that I could put behind me. If I just pass the test, if I fail the test, glory to God, then I fail the course. And so now, 
I'm studying, I'm studying, but, but the thoughts, the ideas, the concepts, the definitions, the formulas, they, they, just, they just didn't seem to stick. I'm cramming, I'm staying up late for a few nights trying to get everything together, trying to do summaries of, of, of chapters, trying to go through everything that, 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 that I had skipped over <clears throat> all, corner, all quarter long. And I'm just trying to get through it, I'm just trying to get through it. And the concepts don't, don't seem to be sticking. And so I'm there, I go to the class, and I'm taking the test. And of course, I'm looking around, it seems like maybe it's just me in, our, in moments of testing, it seems like everybody else is doing good. I, I'm looking around, hoping that I can find the answer on the wall, looking at the clock on the wall, looking at my students and my classmates, all of their heads seem to be down. They seem to be writing pretty good on, on, on the test, and I'm just sitting there sweating. I'm nervous now, like, oh my goodness, I, I, this, this, this test, this test it, it's tough. And so I'm afraid now, this test is tougher than a $10 steak. So you've got to understand, I'm sweating, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, anxiety is setting in and everybody's head seems to be down. Is it just me and in our moments of testing, it seems like everybody else is doing good, but in our moments of testing, it seems like we are just doing the worst and everybody else, people even you, you, you know that you're smarter than, people in the class that I knew that I was smarter than, I was doing bad, but I knew my grade was better than theirs. But it seems like their head was down and they were getting through the test. But I was having trouble. And all of a sudden, the teacher for a moment left the room. <laughs> and now that the teacher has left the room, ideas start to come to my head. Should I reach in my book bag and see if I could grab a few notes? Should I talk to one of my classmates who I'm friends with and ask them what's the answer to question 12 or 13, question number one, question number six? All of a sudden, in the middle of the test, temptation appears. Glory to God. And in the middle of the test, there is a temptation Glory to God in the middle of my test. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I believe I'm not here by coincidence. There's somebody who's watching right now and you say, Pastor Gabriel, you are talking to me. I am being tempted in the middle of my test. Is there anybody watching at home who can testify in the comments and say, Pastor Gabriel, that's me. Like Jesus, I believe I, my life has been led by the Spirit, but in the midst of my wilderness experience, I find myself being tempted in the test. And watch this. Although I was tempted in the test, the teacher, my professor, who gave me the test, they are not responsible for the temptation. They just gave me the test. And although they gave me the test and led me to the test and led me through the test, they prepared me for the test, but they are not responsible for the temptation. As a matter of fact, James chapter 1, read that when you have time. Although it says God does not tempt us, it lets us know where temptation is conceived. It says temptation is conceived in my desires. And it's fi it finds its germination and it is birthed and out of my desires. And once my desires have given birth, now it gives birth to temptation. My temptation came out of my desire to pass the test at all costs. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. Normally by now, I would have somebody testify and saying, Pastor Gabriel, I'm with you. They'd be shouting amen in the crowd. I'd be high-fiving somebody by now on our 11.30 worship, but I can't see you now. I'm in an empty room, so I just need you to testify digitally one more time. Show me some hand emojis, something. Let me know. Pastor Gabriel, I'm with you. You are talking to me, whether you're watching by YouTube, whether you're watching by my Facebook page or our church's Facebook page, whether you're watching by our website where you testify and say you're talking to me. Is there anybody watching who can say, Pastor Gabriel, I'm being tempted in the test. You are being tempted. 
to cheat your way through the wilderness. Oh, glory to God. I'm here to tell you something. Jesus came to this planet to do the works of the Father. Jesus came to this planet ultimately to die on the cross for our sins and rise from the dead to reconcile a broken relationship between God and mankind. But in the process of that, he heals the sick, raises the dead, shows that there's victory in the kingdom of God over the works of darkness. And so he casts out some demons in the process. He heals some people in the process to show that sickness has no victory over the kingdom of God. He, he, he raises the dead to show that death has no victory over the people of God. He provides food to eat for the hungry to show that my God shall supply all of our needs. He is filled with compassion and he sets people free to show that our God cares and he is compassionate. But in order for him to receive license to do all of that in his humanity, through his humanity, God had to put him through the test. Thank you, Jesus. And what I love about Jesus in the wilderness, what I love about the temptation narrative is we get to see Jesus' humanity and his divinity. We get to see that Jesus is God incarnate, but at the same time, we get to see, like Hebrews says, he was tempted in all points just like you and I, yet he was without sin. And I thank God that the Bible gives us that passage in Hebrews that he was tempted like you and I, yet he was without sin. Because I'm here to let you know today that temptation itself is not the sin. So just because you are being tempted, don't use that as a doorway to say, because I had the thought, I've already messed up, I just need to fall into it. No, 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 absolutely not. The Bible says Jesus was tempted and yet was without sin. Don't give yourself over to it. Just because you're tempted doesn't mean you have to fall. And Jesus, to be used by God in the flesh, God incarnate, to walk this earth as a man just like you and I, to be 100% God but also 100% man, to, be, to get sleepy like you and I and not misuse or abuse his power, he had to go through the wilderness. To, to be hungry like you and I and not misuse or abuse his power, he had to go through the wilderness. To, to, to not strike people with, with, with death or, or, or with muteness when they, when they disrespected him, he had to be tested like in the wilderness. To, to, to not cuss people out when they say something crazy, he had to be tested in the wilderness. In order for Jesus to do great ministry as the God-man, he had to go through the wilderness. And though God sent Jesus by his spirit into the wilderness, the enemy sees the wilderness as an opportunity. And in the process of being in the wilderness, the tempter comes. Thank you, Jesus. And the only way the tempter can come is through the avenue of Jesus' desires. And that lets us know that Jesus must have had a desire to be the king of the world. Jesus must have had a desire, thank you, Jesus, to have all the kingdoms and their splendor. Because how else would the enemy come to him with this temptation? Because you cannot be tempted by what you don't want. Glory be to God. I'm preaching whether you know it or not. If I'm talking to you this morning, come on and talk back digitally and say, Pastor Gabriel, you are talking. You cannot be tempted by what you don't want. So there had to be a desire there in order for Jesus to be tempted in this way. And he comes to Jesus. That's one thing about the enemy. He comes at, that, that at opportune times. Luke gives us this. Matthew does not. But Luke says, and Satan, when all of this is over, leaves Jesus for another opportune time. He says, the wilderness is my first 
opportune time is the first opportune time. This is my first opportunity to attack 30-year-old Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. Because after all, I was there. I overheard in Matthew chapter 3 that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So is this the seed that has come to crush my head? And since I have heard that, I've got to come to Jesus at an opportune time. And the Bible says, let's go, Matthew chapter 4, verse number, uh, verse number 2. After fasting 40 days, he was hungry. Verse number three, then the tempter came to him. It's one thing about your enemy and mine. He sits and he watches for opportune times. And he sees the wilderness as an opportune time. This is what happened with Moses and the children of Israel. The wilderness is an opportune time for the enemy. This is why you have to be careful. This is why you can't move away. This is why, if anything, in your wilderness seasons, you have to draw closer to God because the wilderness is an opportune time. This is why in the wilderness, this is why through this tough time period where things are crazy with, with, with political turmoil, with, with pandemics going on, with, with not being able to go places, with restaurants shutting down and waiting in lines for food and, and no access to health care and no job and potential evictions on the way when the moratorium is over. This is why you've got to draw close to God because the wilderness, when I am hungry, when I'm hot, when I'm thirsty, when my children are acting crazy, when my marriage is on the verge of divorce, when I've just received a termination notice, when, when the moratorium is keeping me from being evicted, but I still have no money, so when this is over, I don't know how I'm going to come up with the thousands of dollars I need or else to, to stay in my place. So, so, so I'm going to need some money or else I'm going to have to find a place to stay when this is over. Some people can't wait to get to the next year. Others are saying, can we slow down because I don't know where I'm going to go next. And it's during these time periods in our wildernesses that the tempter comes. And the Bible says after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, he was hungry. Verse 3, the tempter comes to him and he says, glory be to God. The enemy comes to speak to us and tempt us in our wilderness. Though, the, though temptations are not from God, Thank you, Jesus. Temptations are not from God. We have to understand that God will allow the enemy to tempt us in the wilderness. And God can use that temptation, the temptations of the enemy, ultimately for our good. So the temptation does not come from God, but God can use temptations. Not only is the enemy God's foe, but he's God's tool. And if you take time to really allow that revelation to get in your heart, it can save you. It can speak to you in a mighty way that the enemy is a defeated foe, but he is God's foe. But not only is he his foe, he's God's tool. He's God's instrument that God can use him to accomplish a multitude of things. And so it is when Jesus is hungry, when he's thirsty, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, the enemy comes and he starts speaking to him. Jesus is alone. He's by himself. The only thing out there, thank you, Mark, for this, are wild animals. Luke doesn't give us this. Matthew doesn't give us this. But that verse in Mark chapter 1, when it mentions Jesus in the wilderness being tempted, it says, and Jesus was there with the wild animals. So it's just Jesus now isolated, wolves and, and desert animals waiting, watching for him to fall. Maybe vultures are flying up top, seeing Jesus as he stumbles around in the wilderness in the heat of the day, 
not eating for 40 days and 40 nights, waiting for his body to drop so they could circle around. Wild animals, lions we know were there. Bears we know were potentially there. Jesus is there isolated by himself in the wilderness. And Jesus' isolation lets us know that isolation is no security for temptation, from temptation. I'll say it again, write it in the comments, isolation is no security from temptation. As a matter of fact, our present passage of scripture shows us that isolation is highly favorable to temptation. In other words, you think you being off by yourself, locking yourself in a room, chaining yourself down is going to keep you from sexual immorality. You think locking yourself in a room, chaining yourself down is going to keep you from drugs. You think staying off social media, off the phone, not talking to anyone is going to keep you from gossip and from slander. But it's actually the opposite. This gifts the enemy a highly favorable situation to speak into you your life. Who is susceptible, more susceptible to temptation, Pastor Gabriel? I'll tell you, the isolated Christian, the Christian who thinks they have to go through the wilderness by themselves, the Christian who won't phone in for help, the Christian who won't join a small group, the Christian who says, yeah, they have some small groups over there at St. John, but it's not good enough. I'll go at it on my own. The Christian who says, yeah, that teacher, Pastor Gabriel, he's all right, or that teacher of that small group, eh, I know more than them. I don't need that. I don't care if you know some more than the teacher knows. Get in a group. Isolated Christians are more susceptible to temptation. While you're in the wilderness, you don't need to go through this by yourself. You may say, Pastor Gabriel, Jesus went through it by himself. Don't compare yourself to the God-man who was tempted but was without sin. The day you live without sin will be the day that you can go into the wilderness by yourself. The day you live the sinless, sin-free life, that's the day that you can go into the wilderness by yourself. But until then, until you get an S on your chest that says the God-man, you are not able to go into the wilderness by yourself. You need the body of Christ. So, Pastor Gabriel, I've already heard you present one point. How am I going to survive the wilderness? How am I going to get through this temptation in the midst of the test? Stay in groups. Don't get disconnected. Don't get into it by yourself. Don't go through it by yourself. You need the body of Christ praying for you. You need to stay connected. You need to be phoning in friends. You need to join our prayer line each evening at 6 p.m. You need to join our midweek worship service on the phone at 12 noon on Wednesdays. You need to be a part of our Bible studies on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You need to be a part of our Sunday school who meets at 10 a.m. by phone. You need to be a part of our small group gatherings on Thursday nights on Zoom, our Iron Men. You need to be a part of our Blossom groups. You need to be a part of our young women's groups on Zoom. We have options available, but don't get into it by yourself. Somebody today is getting ready to get set free. You're getting ready to go to our website and get on our connect page and say, Pastor Gabriel, connect me with a small group because I can't go through this wilderness by myself. I need to meet with our, 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 our choir and our praise group on Monday nights at 7 p.m. Connect me somewhere. I don't care if it's not the best or if it's not the greatest. I don't care if we're just getting on there talking about nothing. I just need to be connected with the body of Christ because I cannot go through the wilderness by myself. And Jesus is in the wilderness, isolated by himself. And the enemy sees the opening, the opportune time, and he starts talking. And he comes with this famous three-pronged attack. I've got to speed up here because I'm beginning to lose some of you, and I'm getting ready to go. He comes with this three-pronged attack. He has no new tricks. He has no new schemes. He isn't a creator. He can't come up with anything new. He has just three tricks. The Bible gives us to him. It gives them to us in 1 John 2, verse number 16. Look at it. 1 John 2, verse 16, it says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, 
but from the world. Listen to me here. We see his threefold attack. Watch this. Verse 1 John 2, verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, Satan's temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He has a threefold attack, a three pronged attack. People like to imagine the enemy with the three pronged pitchfork. If you want to do it, let's do it. His three pronged pitchfork one is for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Another way to put it is hedonism materialism, and egoism. Somebody talked to me here this morning. So his temptations were hedonism, a lust for pleasure, egoism, being the man, pride of life, materialism, lust of the eye. And I'm here to tell you today, all of his attacks find themselves in this place. All of our temptations find themselves in one of these three areas, hedonism, Egoism and materialism. Lust of the flesh, hedonism. Lust of the eye, materialism. The pride of life, egoism. And this is not new. We've seen him use this trick before. He did it with Adam and Eve in the garden. And he comes to her and he begins to speak to her the same way that he speaks to Jesus. There are two times, write this down, that the enemy will try to come and speak to us. Don't miss this. There are two times he will try to come and speak to us. There are two times that we are more susceptible to his temptation. When things are really good and when things are really bad. And what the enemy will do, watch this, when things are really good, he will get us caught up in egoism. He'll get us caught up in our pride. And when things are really bad, He'll get us caught up in hedonism. He'll get us caught up in materialism. He'll have us to lust for pleasure in the finer things of life. And he'll have us to have the fall into the lust of the eye. We want the material things of life. When things are really good and when things are really bad. He comes to Adam and Eve when things are really good. He says, listen, in your moment of success, there's something that's missing. You can know it all. He appeals to that ego. You can know it all. And he comes to Jesus at the opposite end of the spectrum. When it seems like he's down to his last in the wilderness, all he needs is a bite to eat. Just some water. Wild animals are surrounding him. When one was at the height and when one was at the depths. And he comes and he starts talking. And what he does is he speaks. And he speaks to Eve. And he wants to undermine, watch this, God's goodness. He wants to undermine Eve's trust in God's goodness. And he says to her, listen, God has been good. He's given you everything. But, but if you eat of that, don't you know you'll be like God? And he doesn't want you to know everything. And in the wilderness, we have to battle this. We have to battle this in the temptations of the enemy while in the wilderness. We have to fight against the thought or the idea that God is withholding something from us. That's a dangerous thought. We go through this, Adam and Eve go through this, through their temptation in the garden. And now Jesus goes through this in his temptation in the wilderness where the, the thought or the idea God is withholding something from me. Somebody is having this thought right now in the midst of your wilderness and, and your temptations are housed in this thought that God is withholding something from me. You are tempted to go into ungodly relationships because God is withholding a husband or a wife from me. You are tempting to get ill-gotten gain because God is withholding finances and certain provisions from me. You are tempted to do all types of ungodly things to get the job because God is withholding the promotion from me and you cannot fall victim to this thought, this idea, this sinful idea, this satanic idea that God is withholding something. I'm here to let you know that 
God is not withholding his goodness from us. If we can understand that God has our best interests at mind, in, at, 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 in mind, if we can better understand that God has our best interests at heart, if we can truly understand that God is for us and not against us, I, I, I didn't know that too well a few years ago, but I, I'm knowing a little better year by year now. I'm really starting to come to the understanding that God is for me. In the job loss, God is for me. When I'm hungry, God is for me. When I'm thirsty, God is for me. When I don't have a wife or a husband, God is for me. When I don't have the finances, God is for me. When I seem to have no social media following, God is for me. When I seem to not get invited to any conferences, God is for me. When I seem to have no clergy friends or nobody wants to let me into their circles, God is for me. When I seem to not glory to God to get invited anywhere, to not have some long itinerary like some of my contemporaries, God is for me. You've got to make that up in your mind, whether you know it or not. God is for you. He's for you when he says yes. He's for you when he says no. He's for you when he provides. He's for you when he withholds things. God is for you. God is for you. And Satan comes to undermine God's goodness. And he begins to attack Jesus at an opportune time with this three-pronged attack, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Hedonism materialism, and egoism. And he appeals to him with the lust of the flesh, pleasure. Pleasure through eating. You may say, Pastor Gabriel, why? Why wouldn't he appeal to him through the pleasure of sex? Because you've got to understand you don't need sex when you haven't eaten for 40 days. If you fasted like some of us have from our church earlier this year for 40 days, pleasure is not sex after 40 days of fasting. After 40 days of fasting, pleasure is a stake. After 40 days of fasting, pleasure, glory to God, <laughs> is a buffet line. After 40 days of fasting, and so he comes to him and he appeals to him. The, the, he says, come here. He attacks his identity and goes after him. He just, keep in mind, he just heard God say, this is my beloved son in Matthew chapter 3, in whom I am well pleased. And watch these first words of the temptation in Matthew chapter 4, verse number 2 and 3. The tempter came to him, verse number 3, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, he attacks his identity. If you are the son of God. If Jesus does not pass this test, this temptation, if he does not understand his identity, when certain, when, when certain things come up later on in his ministry, he will fall victim to them. Because he asks them here, if you are the son of God, he presents it to them. There's a possibility you are not. If Jesus falls victim to this statement, Later on in his ministry, when he's hanging on the cross and they say, say you saved others, now save yourself. If he doesn't pass this test, he can't pass that one. If Jesus doesn't pass this test, if you are the son of God, he won't be able to pass the test when they say, physician, heal yourself. Do the miracles here in your hometown that you're doing all around the, the country. If he doesn't pass this test. So in other words, if you don't pass these temptations in the wilderness, they'll just show up again later on in life. I'm here to tell you today, this is why your wilderness experience is so important and there are temptations coming right now for you to do all types of things, to go after all, on type of, all types of ungodly things, but you have to make up in your mind, you will not fall victim to these temptations in the wilderness. So he comes to him, if you are the son of God. I love Jesus' answer in verse number four. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Notice it didn't say that he didn't need food. 
notice it shifts the priority. It didn't say man doesn't live on bread. It says man does not live on bread alone. But he does, however, live on every word. He does, however, live on every word that comes from God's mouth. So it, allow, it gives us the priority. So in other words, I need God's word, then I need food. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. I need God's word, then I need food. And we get these things backwards. I hope you didn't forget the messages that I gave you just earlier this year. Maybe you need to go back in the archives and look at them. Talked about the God of the belly. We dealt with, 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 with fasting. We dealt with prayer at the start of this year. And I'm here to tell you, he gives us the priority in this passage. He says, you need the word of God more than you need baby back ribs. You need the word of God more than you need a steak or a burger. You need the word of God more than you need anything else. He said, I don't live on bread alone, but I do live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. How often do we eat spiritually? You can only survive so long without a personal revelation from God. Some of you right now are dying in your wilderness because you have not had a spiritual word from God. You have not had a spiritual revelation. Watch this, not my revelation. I give you what God has given me, but you need a personal revelation to survive your wilderness. And if you have not had a personal revelation, a word that God has spoken to you during this time, you are struggling in the wilderness. You are spiritually, watch this, spiritually dying in the wilderness. Because you can't live by bread alone. You think you're in a wilderness because you lost a job. You think you're in a wilderness because you're having issues with your finances or certain relationship situations. Things are topsy-turvy, but I'm here to let you know right now you're having trouble in this wilderness because you are spiritually dehydrated. Could it be possible that you are spiritually dehydrated, that you are spiritually lacking the food necessary to survive this wilderness experience? If God gave you a job, if God fixed your marriage, if God fixed your situations, if God healed your body right now, you would think that would fix all of your problems. Could it be possible that you are struggling in this wilderness, not because God hasn't answered your prayers by fixing your situation, but because you have not spent time to get a word from God. So he says to him, turn these stones into bread. You have a legitimate need of hunger, but I want to see if you will satisfy this legitimate need in an illegitimate way. Turn these stones into bread. Then, number two, throw yourself down. Turn these stones into bread. But then he says, okay, he passed that one. I don't live by bread alone, but on every word that comes to him, that comes from the mouth of God. Then verse number five, then the devil took him. Watch this. So for whatever reason, like God did with Job, God gift gives Jesus in his, in his humanity and his physical body over to Satan to allow him in bodily form to take his physical body to a location. For the Bible says, verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. For whatever reason, God allows the enemy to take his physical body, lift him up, and place him at the height of the temple, at the highest point. And he says, throw yourself down. Verse number 6, if you are the son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And this is why you have to be careful in the wilderness. Because, watch this, write this down, don't miss this. In the wilderness, the wilderness is the place of misapplied misused and abused scripture. <clears throat> the wilderness is the place of misapplied scripture, abused scripture, misused scripture, scripture taken out of context. 
This is why I've told you this before, and I'll tell you this again. Although the word is being, is being accelerated in its release, everyone seems to have their messages up, every church, every minister. Be careful who you listen to in this, in this season. Make sure they, they fall in line with the core doctrines of the faith. There are many out there who are screaming, Lord, Lord, but God does not know them. There are many who proclaim to be from the house of God, but God says they have not been sent out from me. The wilderness is a place of misapplied scripture, so be careful who you receive advice from in this season. So he says, Throw yourself down, verse number six. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands. The wilderness. He challenges that identity again. If you are the son of God. The wilderness challenges us. If we will believe God's word. It challenges us. If we will believe what God has said, it challenges our identity. And this temptation was the challenge to Jesus to demonstrate his sonship in a presumptuous way by forcing God to act. This temptation, watch this, I put this on social media a few weeks back as I was preparing for this message. And some of you saw it. But watch this, this temptation is meant to lead us, is meant to lead Jesus to abort his destiny. Watch this, he either wants Jesus to quit before he fulfilled his destiny, or he wants Jesus to attempt to fulfill his destiny before time. He wants to allow Jesus, watch this, to quit or to kill himself before he fulfills his destiny, or he wants Jesus to attempt to fulfill his destiny before time. And these are the primary ways that the enemy tries to tempt us to, fulfill, to abort our destiny. These are the two primary ways that the enemy attempts to or tries or tempts us to try to fulfill our destiny before time. This is how he tries to abort our destiny. In these two ways, he'll say, fulfill it before time, try to fulfill it before time, because he understands if you get it out of God's timing, it's not going to work. Either get to the party too late or arrive at the party too early. So he says, go, jump off. Force God to act based on your foolish decision. Watch this. Force God to use his angels. I'm here to have news. I have news for you for the body of Christ. Angels don't come when you want them to. Angels come when God commands them to. I don't know who that's for, but I'm going to leave that right there and just allow it to sit there. Angels don't come at our beck and call. Angels are sent to serve us, but angels are not our servants. Angels serve only God. They come at the beck and call of God. So even if we have angels surrounding us, they are only there because God says, go and surround Gabriel. He's getting ready to make a bad decision. Go and keep Gabriel as he drives over there. Go and keep Miss so-and-so as she goes over there. Angels are sent to serve us, but they are not our servants. They serve God. Angels don't come at our beck and call. And so we cannot put ourselves in foolish situations and force God to act. We cannot walk and be in rooms with hundreds and thousands of people, wear no mask and say, God, now heal me. We cannot walk in rooms, shake everybody's hands during the season, hug everybody, and then say, God, now make it so I don't have to be on a ventilator. We cannot force God to act. And Jesus gets through this. By using the passages in Deuteronomy, the very places we were last week. You think I just make these sermons up out of my head, but God lays them out so methodically. The answers were in the passages that we read last week. He goes back to Deuteronomy 8, and he says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Man does not live by bread alone. The same verses that God Moses and the children of Israel in through the wilderness. I'm going to use those verses to get me through my experience where they failed in the wilderness. I'll use those verses that they didn't use and I'll allow them to reap the benefits and lead to my success. 
And Jesus says, I don't put the Lord my God to the test. And finally, he goes after his ego, egoism. He says, listen, the pride of life, pride, the sin that God hates, pride, the sin that's, the, that's at the top of his list. He hates it so much. He said, I don't even hate that. I hate pride so much. You don't even have to be proud or be prideful. Just don't even look prideful. I hate it that much. A haughty eye, the Bible says, God hates. He hates someone who even looks proud. He says, look like you're humble, even if you're not. That's how much I can't stand pride. You have no reason to boast. You have no reason to brag. But he attempts to get at him through pride, through egoism. Listen, God has given me a portion of the kingdoms of this world. I am the God, little g, of this world. That's what your Bible says, right, Jesus? Yeah, I know it hasn't been written yet, but go with me, pray with me. I am the God of this world. I am the prince of the power of the air. That's, that's what's going to be written about me later. He doesn't know the future, but again, go with me. He knows the scriptures we can see. He, he misapplies them and tells half-truths, which are lies. So he's the father of lies, so we can't believe anything he says. But he knows enough to quote the scriptures. And so he says, Jesus... The kingdoms of this world have been given to me. And I can give them to whoever I want to. Verse number 8. And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Verse 9. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. If you will bow down and worship me. It's tempting him at the point of his ego. If Jesus doesn't take proper accounting of who he is, if he doesn't know his identity, he can fall victim to this temptation in the wilderness. And Jesus answers him with the word, it is also written, away from me, Satan, verse number 10. For it is also written, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So quickly, I got to go. I'm way over time. How did Jesus survive the wilderness? Write these three points down. How did Jesus survive the wilderness? Number one, by knowing God's word. When the enemy tried to misrepresent or misapply God's word, Jesus said, it is written. Be careful in the wilderness. I told you this before because the wilderness is a place of misapplied scripture. Be careful what you hear in this season and who you're hearing it from. The people you need speaking into your life spiritually right now need to be tried and tested to be proven true. So he survived the wilderness by knowing God's word. The enemy will attempt to manipulate God's word. The manipulation of the word of God, the abuse of the word of God has been used throughout history. Slave masters have done it. Warmongers have done it. All types of people, male, uh, 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 chauvinistic males, uh, chauvinism has taken place because people have abused and misused God's word. Slavery, a number of things have taken place because people have misused and abused God's word. You've got to know God's word for yourself. So how do I survive the wilderness? Number one, by knowing God's word word. Number two, how do I survive the wilderness? Watch this, write this down, by living in the fullness of the Spirit. By living in the fullness of the Spirit. I told you this before, you don't see it in Matthew, but it's in Luke's account. The Bible says that Jesus, full of the Spirit, entered into the wilderness. The fullness of the Spirit. The Bible says that the Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. In other words, when we are living in the fullness of the Spirit, that means the Spirit of God occupied every area of Jesus' life. He gave no place to the devil. There was no opening. There was no doorway for him to get in. He lived in the fullness of the Spirit. And you have to allow the Spirit to take over every area of your life. If you do not, the one area that you are not allowing God in could be the very doorway that the enemy slips in. If you are not allowing the Spirit to get into your diet, the enemy can come in 
through your diet and attack you in the area of your health. If you are not allowing the spirit to help you make decisions on the relationships you are in, the people you need to date, the, the, the enemy could come in through that doorway and attack you through ungodly relationships. If you are not allowing the spirit to come into your life and guide you on what you should watch on TV, that get, could give a doorway to the enemy. And he comes in, and now you find yourself falling victim to the temptations of pornography or watching ungodly movies or ungodly scenes in rated R or mature adult sequences on television. Anywhere that you do not allow the spirit to take control of, you are leaving an opening, a doorway for the enemy to get in. How do I survive the wilderness? By knowing the word of God, by living in the fullness of the spirit. But number three, you've got to survive the wilderness by knowing what you have. You survive the wilderness by knowing what you have. Proper accounting of our lives is needed in the wilderness. You can't look at what you don't have and for, begin to forget about God's blessings because when you take accounting of your life in the wilderness, you can look around and you can all of a sudden begin to think that God hasn't given me much. But I'm here to tell you, if you look close enough, if you look a little bit deeper, you have been given everything that you need. Where are you getting this from? Whether you know it or not, the Bible says, Ephesians 1 verse 3, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You haven't fallen short in, every, in any area. Every spiritual blessing that you needed, you have it right now. All of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms have been gifted to us who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, you have everything you need for life and godliness. This is in your Bible and in mine. You have everything you need. Will you type this into your digital neighbor right now and tell them I have everything that I need. Tell them I'm not lacking in any area. I'm not falling short in any area. I have everything that I need. You can't tempt me with anything, Satan, because I've taken a proper spiritual accounting of my life. And everything that God says is mine spiritually, I already have it. And this is what Jesus could have fallen victim to when the enemy says, I give you the kingdoms of this world. But I can imagine in my mind's eye that Jesus had a thought and says, everything in this world is already mine. I was there in Colossians 1 when everything was made through the Son, Jesus Christ. He was the channel, the conduit that all of the power and the creative force of God the Father Father, flowed through the son of Jesus Christ. He was there in the beginning and the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of my God and his Christ. Jesus already has the kingdoms of the world. But if he had not taken a proper accounting of his life, if he didn't recognize what he already had, he could have fallen victim to this temptation don't allow the enemy to tempt you with what you already have. I'm speaking to a husband. As, as your marriage is in a wilderness, you already have a beautiful wife who can satisfy you sexually. Don't allow the enemy to tempt you with an illicit relationship. Don't allow him to tempt you with what you already have. It may be in a wilderness season right now, but you already have it. He's given you everything you need for pleasure. He's given you everything you need for companionship. He's given you everything you need for partnership. Don't fall in the wilderness. I close. How do I survive the wilderness? By knowing God's word. By living in the fullness of the spirit. By knowing what I have. And the Bible says, that moment, verse number 11 of Matthew 4, then the devil left him. Luke says, for, a more, for another opportune time, but we don't get that in Matthew's account, but Matthew just says, then the devil left him. Watch this. And the angels came and attended him. Then the devil left him, and the angels came. And attended him. I don't know who this is for, but the angels are coming. Glory to God.
Type that in the comments right now. The angels are coming. If you just stay right there, I know you're in the midst of a wilderness season. But I'll speak over your life right now that the angels are coming. Pastor Gabriel, what do you mean by that? You're speaking in spiritual metaphors and analogous terms. What do you mean by that? I'm here to tell you that the strength you need to survive the wilderness is on the way. God is sending the strength that you need to survive the wilderness. You will make it through this. You will make it through this wilderness. Somebody right now, lift your hands wherever you are as you watch this. I'm here to speak into your life that the angels are coming. Strength is coming to you right now to survive this wilderness experience. You're getting ready to know God's word like never before. You're getting ready to take a proper accounting of your life. You know what you have. The Spirit is reminding you of everything you have right now. You have grace. You have mercy. You have God's goodness chasing after you. You have election. You have God's sovereignty. You have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You have justification. You have everything you need for life and for godliness. You know God's word. You're getting ready to walk in the fullness of the Spirit so you won't give place to the enemy in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. Hide it in our hearts. Bless these people who stayed here with me for this hour or so to hear your word. Thank you that you've given us what we need to survive the wilderness. You've given us your word. Thank you, Father, that your word is life and is bringing life and strength to your people right now. We thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I close, Luke chapter 4 gives us something that Matthew didn't give us. In verse number 14, Verse 13 of Luke 4 says, when Jesus had finished, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him, that is Jesus, until an opportune time. But watch this. I love Luke 4 because now Luke 4 gives us something that Matthew didn't give us. When Jesus comes out of the wilderness, verse 14, Jesus then returned to Galilee. Watch this in the power of the Spirit. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Don't miss it. In Luke 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led into the wilderness. But in verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit. He entered into the wilderness in the fullness of the Spirit. But when he left the wilderness, he left in the power of the Spirit. I'm speaking to the church, the body of Christ right now, some pastors, some ministry leaders who watch us. And thank you for viewing. I'm here to let you know right now that your church, your ministry, you as an individual, you are getting ready to walk into the power of the Spirit. I speak over your life that the dunamis, the dynamite power, the miraculous work and power of the Spirit is getting ready to enter into your life right now. If you can make it through the wilderness on the other side, you will walk in the power of the Spirit. Church, I'll speak to you and say, if we can survive this wilderness, if we cannot give up, if we can stay united, if we cannot tear each other down, if we can get through this on the other side of this wilderness, we're going to be walking in the power of the Spirit. On the other side of this wilderness, we're going to be able to turn water into, the, into wine. On the other side of this wilderness, we can heal sick and raise the dead. On the other side of the wilderness, we can provide food to 5,000 men plus women and children. On the other side of the wilderness, your best days are ahead. Survive the wilderness in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody's watching and you're outside of relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to come into relationship with him. Invite him into your life right now. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. 
I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the dead. Jesus, will you come into my life and save me and change me? I invite you in. I make you Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. That Jesus who made it through that wilderness experience died on the cross for you and for me, for our wrongdoings, for our sins. And you just invited him into your life. You are now saved from the penalty of your sins. Congratulations. Today is your spiritual birthday. Will you direct message me if you're watching on Facebook? If you're on YouTube, will you type, in, type into the comments right now that I've accepted Jesus? And we want to save your information and get some information to you. If you're on the website, will you go to the contact or the connect page and say, I've accepted Jesus into my life? One of those three avenues, direct messages, get at us in the comments. Connect with us on our website and just say, I've invited Jesus into my life. Congratulations to you. Today is your spiritual birthday. Until we meet again, surviving the wilderness. Glory be to God. God bless you.